What is going on, everyone? Nick from Comic Culture here. Time for Nick at Night, my weekly comic book review show. Let's go over the books I read this week. We're going to start over in Marvel with Star Wars Visions issue number one. Now, Visions came out a little while ago. I feel like it's been over a year or so. And so we're going to get another issue right here, a new number one, but we get some familiar faces. So that is good. It's very lone wolf and cub ish. There are some familiar faces. So, you know, you're reading this book and you can draw all those uh, similarities. And so that was pretty interesting. So there's a little bit of something here for the old school Star Wars fans. And if you're into Okazaki's art style, oh my God, man, you get such a treat inside of this issue. It's all black and white. Of course, we get some lightsaber battles and things like that, but we get some awesome landscapes as well. And we get a cool story about you know, this droid following along with this one force user and there's like a prophecy or something like that of another one coming to essentially take his place. And that's what we have inside of this issue. We get some really awesome battles. We get some interesting uses of like the force or lightsaber mechanics in general, which I think is really cool. And we get some just amazing artwork inside this book. So I would highly, highly recommend checking out Star Wars Visions and the previous issue that came out, I don't know, maybe like a year ago. So definitely check out both of these. And there's some amazing covers from Peach Momoko. And we also had Stan Sakai on the other variant as well. So it's a win-win, guys. Check this one out. It was great. Next Marvel book we read was Blade issue number nine. So this series has been pretty consistent so far. So at least it's been fun. It's been engaging. The pace has been interesting. But it kind of falls into the same trap as the current Hulk book right now, where it's just very episodic. We feel like we're inching forward instead of like taking these giant leaps or concluding things in a timely manner. So that's the only thing I have against this book. With that said, it's still interesting and it's still a good read. And I think it's heading in a good place. It's just taking its sweet time getting there. So Blade has been, um, he's been leveling up, getting some artifacts, getting some new allies, uh, getting some new powers and things like that to take on Adina, Adna, I don't know how to pronounce the name. And there's one more thing he has to do to really get her attention, get this demon's attention. And it's basically to burn down down, essentially the library of the other world and the other world is like the demon world right so he goes into there it's kind of like a sacred place that nobody ever messes with and it's his way of baiting her out because she's hiding right now and it was a really cool way of handling all that there's some dr strange stuff in here as well so it's a really interesting story and i can't wait to see this wrapping up inevitably it's going to wrap up and i feel like we're heading in that direction right now so blade issue number nine cool run very episodic doesn't really go anywhere but it's still entertaining so let me know what you guys think if you're reading it down below all right let's check out the new number one from star wars we have Django fett so i was really interested in reading this book because i like the character of boba fett and of course we know the history and everything and some of the prequel stories expanded on that so that was pretty cool the interiors of this book are awesome as well of course it's about a, a galaxy famous bounty Bounty Hunter, right? So there's going to be lots of action, cool scenes, lots of battles, things blowing up, all kinds of stuff, right? And then the book takes a couple different turns right here, and we start talking about these two different societies coming together, sharing this artifact that they have, which inevitably gets stolen, and now there's a bounty on like where this thing went or who has it, something like that, and Jango Fett's actually one of the people that is hired to take on this mission, and so now we have like competing bounty hunters and all sorts of stuff happening right now, and some sabotage attempts, you know, just normal stuff that Jango Fett has to deal with. So it was action packed. Lots of cool art in here. The story was interesting as well. It wasn't boring. So you can definitely jump into Django Fett. You'll have a good time. Let me know if you write it down below. All right, let's go over to DC. We have John Constantine Hellblazer Dead in America issue number three. Again, what a, what a mouthful there. So this book is really cool. What this series does really, really well. I'm not going to get into the big specifics of this particular issue. Just know that it carries the same themes as the previous issues and the previous run. If you haven't read those runs, what they're doing inside of these books is really cool because they don't just rely on John and whatever his uh, entourage is at the time. They don't just let them run the book. They introduce all these other beings that have a purpose, that have a point to be inside of the story. And so I think it's really cool how they could take their characters. They can develop them very quickly in a single issue. They can make it relevant to the, to the quest that John is on at the moment. And they can weave those characters into the story in just such an interesting way. They do a really good job of that. Of course, we have Swamp Thing. He's trying to resurrect himself right now because I feel like there are ties to the Rom V run inside of this with this swamp thing like coming out of the repercussions of that act but we're also introducing some other characters from lore right whether that's American lore or Hispanic lore things like that we're introducing these characters and again they make sense to live inside here and there's always some kind of poetic beautiful 
twisted message in each issue of this run and the previous run. And we do a great job of kind of bringing it all together at the end. Well, all at the same time, bringing in really interesting art and everything. I would say that's, I've heard some complaints of the coloring that it's just a little bit too much. It's all over the place, but I really dig it. The art and the coloring in this book are just beautiful, I think. I think it matches the tone of the book for sure, because obviously it's heavy in demonology and myth and lore and legend, things like that. So I feel like it's it's a, it's a great pairing, right? And so another great issue of Hellblazer, I think. It's been a really great run so far. We're only three issues in. There are some other runs you can read leading up into this, which will give you a lot of context for this particular run, but you could jump into here and just write it out. But I think you're going to miss some of the flavor and some of the history if you do that. So I would recommend the previous run leading into this. I think it's about 11 issues or 12 issues, if I'm not mistaken. Then you can jump into here. It's a really great read, though. Let me know if you're reading it down below. All right, next from Tom King, we have Wonder Woman issue number seven, a complete halt on what's going on in the current story right now. Issue number six was action packed. We had basically our Legion of Doom, all the all the classic villains for Wonder Woman teaming up with this like tyrannical government to take on Wonder Woman in an amazing issue in issue number six. Issue number seven, Diana and Clark going out shopping for a birthday present for Batman in the Mall of the Galaxies, whatever it's called. Essentially, it's that. It's the biggest place in the galaxy where you can basically buy anything. And Wonder Woman has to worry about parking tickets and validating and villains buying illegal artifacts to take out Superman at the time. And they get manicures and pedicures and they try to figure out what they're going to get Batman for his birthday. Yes, there are some pretty cool moments inside of this. There's some interesting dialogue. There's some funny bits and some jokes and things like that, dad jokes and whatnot. But at the end of the day, it's like I was so excited coming out of issue number six. I wanted to see something happen. I wanted to see a continuation of what's going on there. We didn't get it in here. We had very small hints of what happened inside of issue number six, but we didn't go anywhere besides that. Again, yes, it had good moments. It had some humor and things like that, but you really can't slow down the issue like this. And there was no backstory with the Trinity, which was really a bummer for me. So issue number seven, I don't know. What'd you guys think overall? And would you have just rather had like a continuation of where we left off in issue number six? Let me know down below. From Image Comics, we have G.I. Joe, Real American Hero. We're up to issue number 305. It's so hard to remember where we are with this. So um, the way that I look at these G.I. Joe books right now, especially with the Energon Universe versions of G.I. Joe, like Duke and Cobra, and we're going to get some more coming out soon, is like, this is like the more like proper book, I would say. And if you're into like the arcade version, remember how in games there would be Madden, but then you'd also have like NFL Blitz. This is the Madden to the Energon Universe's uh, NFL Blitz. They're both fine, but they're just two different flavors of the character. If you want a more serious, like nuts and bolts, kind of a G.I. Joe experience, I think you're going to be just fine inside of G.I. Joe Real American Hero. Obviously, I have Larry Hama on here, so doing some great work. The art on this book is really good as well. And there's some really cool uh, things happening between all the different factions and things like that. So I think the vibe and the feel and the story of G.I. Joe Real American Hero is great. I don't hear enough people talking about it. The Energon stuff is fine as well, but this one just seems like more of a book for... I don't know, like the purists and maybe I'm just like overthinking it, but that's just how I feel about this issue right here and this series in general so far. I'm loving the hell out of this book and I'm also enjoying the Energon stuff too. So it's like a win-win for me. If you're a G.I. Joe fan, you're in a great place right now, I think. Let me know if you're reading it down below. All right, so we got out of G.I. Joe. Let's go into Cobra Commander since they're both from Image. This was my favorite issue of Cobra Commander that we've had so far. They really, really lean into how much of a badass Cobra is inside of this issue. He's being interrogated right now from like these swamp bandits or whatever, and they have have lots of resources and of course they have like their archetypes one guy's got a flamethrower the other guy's got a certain kind of gun one guy's an electric guy or whatever and if you're a gi joe guy and you know these characters then great if you're not a gi joe guy like you can imagine these characters existing with inside of that universe and there's some gnarly scenes inside of this issue i almost don't even want to show you some of the stuff but i'll show you some of the pages in between the big moments so you can get a sense of the art style in here joshua williamson is on this one and uh, again this was my favorite issue cobra takes a beating he keeps on going and it, this is like his big escape as well from these guys and some of the reinforcements show up and the next issue is going to be great as well so cobra commander my favorite issue of this run so far, we're on only on issue number three, but it's really cool. What do you guys think? All right, next issue we're going to go over is Tenement issue number 10 from Jeff Lemire, Andrea Sorrentino, and Dave Stewart. Probably my favorite book of the Bone Orchard mythos. That's including 10,000 Black Feathers. That's including The Passageway. And uh, yeah, Tenement was definitely my favorite. The conclusion of this book leaves a little bit to be desired, I think, just in general. And it's my problem with 
really understanding the connection between everything. The basic premise here is that there are lots of worshipers of Cain, like Cain and Abel Cain. And because of that, there's all this new evil and everything else. And I think these worshipers are led by these seven different like acolytes of Cain. And they have this like ability to propagate their evilness throughout the world. And there's these concentrated areas of evil. And we're exploring one of those right here. And I did like the journey that these particular characters went on to get to the bottom of all this because there was lots of character development and there's the character interactions that were just really great and handled really, really well. But the art in this series alone just completely takes the cake, I think. Some of the imagery inside this book was absolutely spectacular. And some of the explanations about what's going on, like who the seven were in the previous issues, like those were like paintings, man. Those were so beautiful. But we have an image of Cain right here, basically, I don't know, coming to be alive or something or take up take a part of the sacrifice that was being given to him so he can unleash his power to the world, which I guess is their ultimate goal. But yeah, there's just like a lot of cool scenes inside of this book. A lot of things that are just so trippy. You don't even know what's real. It's hard to imagine like anybody surviving this ordeal, but it was pretty cool. So like, I think this is the root of everything that's happening in the passageway in 10,000 Black Feathers. We basically have this evil power, gaining all these resources, like getting all these followers, things like that. And we're trying to ascend out to attack the world, which I think is the basic premise of what's going on inside this book. Can't wait to talk about it more with you guys. Let me know your theories down below if you're reading it. It, let me know. All right, Kill Your Darlings issue number seven. I'm loving this run so far because it's a combination of a lot of cool things, right? It's kind of like Scotty Young's I Hate Fairyland mixed with witches, which I think is really cool. Our main character is Rose and she's a witch and she just kind of learns that she's a witch. She has a very overactive imagination, I would say, and some of her imagination, uh, the things that she can think of manifest in the real world because she doesn't quite know how to handle her powers and that's just what happens. There's another witch that we focus on with some via some flashbacks who was persecuted in the past, she escapes those people and finds a way basically to live forever. But how she's able to do that was actually stolen from her inadvertently by Rose's mother. And it's just like a real complicated, but yet cool story at the same time. So there's like a revenge mission going on right now. This evil witch is taking out her revenge on Rose and the entire world that she put together her imagination world. And it's just so cool to see all those different blends of style and everything mixed together right here. And I will also say this book is super brutal as well. There's lots of gore, lots of action. At first it seems like it's pretty innocent, but then there's a couple pages where people literally get ripped in half and it's just so brutal. So it's a really, really cool book. So if you like fantasy style books, you wanna throw a little bit of like witchcraft stuff into there, I think you're gonna dig this one a lot. It's uh, got some more issues to go. We're on issue number seven right now. So I highly recommend it if you haven't read it yet, check it out. All right, next let's go over to something epic issue number eight from Kadransky. Now, if you did not read the previous arc, you don't necessarily need to read it. There's a very small recap or there's some mention of what happened in the previous one, maybe some lessons learned or something like that from the previous arc, but it's not necessary reading going inside of this one. What you need to know though is there are certain people out in the world called epics. Now these epics can see people's imaginations, people's creations come to life uh, right there in front of them. So it's something that they can see. It's almost like a sixth sense that they have where they can see all these different animated characters or whatever they might be in the real world. They can interact with them and whatnot. So we're actually following Noah. She's a private eye and she's kind of down on her luck right now. And she comes across this, for lack of a better term, imaginary character and actually teams up with this character to take on this new case that she otherwise couldn't do. And it's basically like a Howard the Duck type character. But I just love the dialogue between these two. Like she obviously does not want anything to do with this guy, but like their conversations are just so fun. It leads him under this case and they're actually bringing up some pretty important characters and iconic characters from literature and I just love who he brings into the story. I'm not going to spoil that for you but it's some pretty iconic people, you know, and it's fun to see how he twists those characters around a little bit to make them fit inside the story so I loved everything that was going on inside of there. Again, the art is absolutely incredible. I mean, there's a reason why the imprint is one man art comics from Image on here. Kodransky does such a great job on the writing and the art just does such a great job. If you Again, if you haven't read the first arc, I highly recommend reading that one. You can go into this one and you'll be fine so far. But also check out Blood Commandment that just wrapped up recently. It's going to hit trade here in about a month or so. So make sure to check that one out too. But something epic. Here we go again, guys. Let me know if you're reading it. Let me know what you thought. Next, we have Horvath on Beneath the Trees Where Nobody Sees Issue Number Four. The best title for a comic book out right now, I think. 
This is the issue where everything hits the fan. We finally get some answers about who is this other competing psychopath, this serial killer, besides Sam inside of this town. This is the issue where you get the answer to that question. And I just love all the teasing leading up to this point. There was a very cool conversation on, I think it was Comic Pop, with Scott Snyder and Horvath talking about the different approach to horror. And I'd love the breakdown that they had inside of here talking about Sam and her kind of indifference or her nonchalantness living in this society, but having this dark side of her as well that she's hiding from everybody and what it's like when that is interrupted, right? Like she thinks she's in this place where she's got everything figured out, but there's this other force now that's entered her life, entered her town, and it's completely disrupting everything. And we get some really cool moments inside of here with this other character. I'm almost afraid to show you anything because I don't want to ruin who this character might be, but everything's hitting the fan right now. All those things that we saw in issue number one, those paint cans, things like that, those are popping back up right now. This other series Serial killers really messing with Sam. Now Sam's on the run, and how is she going to retaliate? We're going to be seeing what's going on in the next issues. But this was a really, really great book. I love the progression, the storytelling, and the characterizations and the artwork inside of this thing, man. It's just like one of the best comics that's out right now, for sure. So if you're not reading Beneath the Trees where nobody sees, it's definitely gory. It's got a Richard Scarry approach from the art style. It's got a compelling murder mystery thing thrown on top of this following a serial killer. It's just so cool. Definitely check this one out if you haven't and pick up the trade. If you're not picking up the single issues, you won't regret it. Let me know if you're reading it. All right, let's go over to Dark Horse for the last two books. We have Rom V and Evan Cagle on Dawn Runner issue number one. I remember hearing Rom talk about this on an interview a little while ago, and it was going to be like a mech versus kaiju kind of a book with a cool little twist to it. It, and this is a really, really great issue. And it certainly delivers on that mech versus kaiju premise that he was talking about. But it takes a cool approach to this because the society here actually popularized these kaiju battles. And there's these different variations or different iterations of these mech suits that people are wearing. And in this issue, we're introducing like the next iteration of that. And we're going to see how it fares against one of the biggest, baddest kaijus in the land right now. So these monsters, they dropped in via some kind of portal. They've basically walled off this city so they stop the spread of these monsters and so now basically for sport and entertainment they're fighting them and again we're talking about the next iteration of mechs that they're going to be using to do this and what i love about this is the assimilation process between the best human pilot that they have and this new suit that they have which is technically not ready to, for prime time but of course like an old sci-fi fashion we're going to just go ahead and jump the gun and make things happen but i love the moment in this book where the two beings become one. There's like this matrix style pod or sensory deprivation tank and all these different wires that are hooked up to you. It's connected to your nerves. It's supposed to be something that's completely assimilated with you. So there's no delay or latency between your movements or your intended movements and what your suit is actually doing. We get some gnarly battles in this thing as well. Like this is a pretty crazy thing. It's definitely got some Gundam niche feel to it, but of course it's like a mech first kaiju kind of a thing. So there's easy to draw those comparisons, but there's also another storyline going on here. And I'm wondering if it's like emotions that are happening in the same place, kind of bleeding into different realities or something like something bad happened in this area way in the past and something bad is happening in this area now. And maybe the energy of those emotions are overlapping, but we see some things that we don't quite understand just yet inside of this book, but I'm really anxious to see what's going on. So if you're into mechs versus kaiju kinds of things, if you're into Rom V, you definitely got to check out Dawn Runner. It was a great, great issue. Number one from Dark Horse. Let me know if you read it. All right, let's wrap this up with, if you find this, I'm already dead issue number two from Matt Kent in this magazine size format. Issue number one was really great. It left us in a really unsettling place because there's this portal that was found outside of the Earth's atmosphere. When you enter that portal, there's a new world on the other side, and that world is extremely hostile with all these different aliens and monsters and stuff. So the team that we sent down into that planet basically got ripped apart. We have a soul survivor on her own right now, and she's on the run from all these different alien races and things like that. Now, this is a formed society. There's actually lots of history here. So this is not like a primitive alien force. There's actually like governments and structures and religions and currency and things like that. We talk about how old this place must be inside of this book, again, with like societies being built on foundation after foundation after foundation of previous societies. And she gets to see a little bit behind the scenes as to like how this world 
actually works, like how it functions. Where does the power come from? Who are like the slaves of the society? Who are the masters of the society? She draws a lot of comparisons to the world that she came from into here. And she kind of chops it up as universal constants and how beings in general, how life in general treats each other. And there's some pretty cool uh, revelations in here as to who might be like the ultimate person behind the scenes. And so, you know, we get to play on that a little bit more in the future issues. I think the art's handled really well. I think this issue in particularly takes a little bit of a leap forward, a little bit further of a leap forward than I would expect. Um, you know, she's like learning the language and she's a sitting, uh, learning the ropes on how to like hide and things like that. So a lot of time passes in this issue and it kind of like chops it up to like her just being good at hiding and navigating the streets and like scavenging for food and knowing what type of beetle in this place is the only thing that she can eat and keep down everything else she throws up. The other thing that kind of annoyed me was in the back of this book, it looks like you're going to get some kind of a breakdown in the language because there's some parts in this book where there's an alien language. I think I obviously that's a reference to it, I would imagine. But when I went back to kind of match up those symbols, I couldn't figure it out. <laughs> and so that was kind of annoying. I spent some time trying to figure that out and I just couldn't. But if you find this, I'm already dead. Issue number two. I liked it a lot. I liked issue number one a little bit better. Issue number two is out. It's still good. It's an interesting story. I'll definitely keep going with issue number three and on. Let me know if you're reading it and what your thoughts are. All right, guys. So that's all I read this week. Let me know what you read and what your favorite books of the week were down below in the comments. And while you're down there, like, subscribe, share, hit that bell notification to be alerted whenever I put out new videos. Thank you again for watching. We'll see you in the comments.